Thank you all so much for coming. My name is Yvette Postel and I work in the Adult Programs Department here at the Rogers Memorial Library. We want to thank all of you for coming tonight for the special visit with fashion designer Stan Herman. And before we get started, I want to mention that we will have some uh, refreshments um, out on the patio afterward, so uh, you're all welcome to stay for that. That would be nice to join us. And there will also be copies available of Stan's book in the back. So that will be also a treat. For sale and signing. Yeah. Oh, for sale and signing, yes. <laughs> for sale and signing. <laughs> And since, since he spoke, we'd like to give a special thank you to David Alpern, who has, David has been such a great friend to our library over the years. He's been responsible for bringing us so many great uh, people, including Stan Herman. So we really have a, oh, a huge uh, debt of gratitude to David and for all he's done for us. And just a few words about David before he introduces our guest. David Alpern reported, wrote, or edited at the New York Post, the Daily Journal of Elizabeth, New Jersey, United Press International, and Newsweek Magazine, running the Newsweek On Air and For Your Ears Only network radio shows for three decades. He now reviews books for the East Hampton Star, and he presents programs like this one for libraries near his home in Sag Harbor. Please welcome David Alpern. Thanks for coming. I didn't realize I already knew Stan Herman when I met him the first time on the tennis court in Sag Harbor. I didn't realize it when I met him there the second time or the third time. Uh, it was only when I saw his Mr. Mort email address that I realized he was among the least laugh-getting guests on the most watched David Susskind TV show ever, <laughs> titled How to Be a Jewish Son, back in 1970. Not that he didn't recall with great animation how his mother removed the door from his bedroom and the lock from the bathroom, banishing pubescent privacy forever and producing, I quote, most embarrassing moments. Of course, it was hard to shine on a panel dominated by Madman Mel Brooks, actor George Siegel, and humorous Dan Greenberg, Nora Ephron's first husband. You can still find it on YouTube. I also didn't know that I knew Stan's work, uh, not having previously watched him sell his women's loungewear and sleepwear personally and with feeling on QVC cable. But then I learned he also created the uniforms we all see on uh, employees at Federal Express, TWA, JetBlue, McDonald's, uh, so many other uh, inescapable corporate giants. Uh, indeed, the people's designer, as he's called now, addresses more men and women across the country and around the world every day than any of fashion's more famous creators. Uh, fashion was not the strangest calling for a boy with a father in the silk business, born at Brooklyn Jewish Hospital, as was I, uh, but raised in Passaic, New Jersey, Stan studied at the University of Cincinnati's College of Design, Architecture, Art, and Planning, and at the Trap Hagen School of Fashion in New York. Uh, with time out for some singing on Broadway, though he loves opera more. Uh, he worked his way up to head designer for Mr. Moore, ready to wear, and went on to win three Cody Awards, Fashion's Oscars. Uh, in a record 16 years as president of the Council of Fashion Designers of America, CFDA, Stan Hook consolidated various events of the annual New York Fashion Week uh, under giant tents in Bryant Park, the view from the studio as it happens, uh, and where there's now a bench with his name on it and firm malice at one time associated. <laughs> he was commended by Mayor Michael Bloomberg not only for his unique uniform and fashion designs, but also for the worldwide attention and support and that Fashion Week focused on the $35 billion garment industry in New York and for the multi-million dollar philanthropy uh, into which he led the CFDA focused largely on AIDS, breast cancer, and victims of the September 11th World Trade Center attack. Uh, with memory refreshed by completing his new memoir, provocatively titled Uncross Your Legs, which he will shortly explain, uh, Stan will say more about the styles and stars of his career and the lessons of a long life filled with purpose and passions, time for play, and for pondering that life. Uh, and there will be books full of sketches and photos for sale and signing. 
As for tennis, thanks to which I learned what a great guy he is, um, I can say only that when last seen on court at age 95, <sighs> Stan Herman still did better than at least one player nearly 15 years younger. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> uh, so now the ball is in your court. Uh, and the first question to be served, of course, is about that title. Explain it. Oh, first of all, thank you for this introduction. My God. Who is Stan Herman? Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Well, you know, in the fashion shows, um, something happens when the lights go down and all the people in the front row have their legs crossed. I don't know why they do, but they have their legs crossed. And years ago, Bernie and I, as we went to a thousand shows, we, we watched the photographers at the end get hysterical because the legs were blocking the way the models would walk down the runway. And so one of the uh, great photographers, Richie Renner, decided to use the expression, uncross your legs, uncross your leg. Look, some good friends is given. Uncross your legs, and that's how, so that the, the models can be seen as they go down. And that's how the, the title came to me. Uh, it, it, was, it was a natural for me. Uh, and of course, it has all kinds of other meanings. David, David's been pushing the other meanings, but <laughs> we won't go into that. Well, let's go back to the beginning. Your father's silk shop, his sense of fabric, uh, the profusion of patterns. Could you feel that beginning to shape your own interest in fashion and design? Oh, there's no doubt about it. My father had a beautiful group of... By the way, my brother is here, too. I have a 91-year-old brother. I'm 96. He's 91. <laughs> My father, my father was an elegant man, and he had these silk stores. There was no doubt in my mind that uh, they influenced my life. I became. Did this just go off? No. Keep it closer. Uh, it, there's no doubt about the fact that I used to go down on Friday to sell in the store. Uh, I discovered the pattern books. I watched the ladies in Vogue and Harp and and, and Advance and Simplicity patterns and McCall, and I watched in my own way, how fashion was being built. This is going back to the 30s and 40s, a long time ago. Uh, sketching is key to your designer's art and to the memories of people and places uh, that illustrate this memoir. When did you first start to sketch, and, and what were you sketching? Pornographic stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no, I sketched from the very beginning. I always was a good sketcher. My brother's a painter. I'm a sketcher. Uh, the pilot pen is, I think, is most important to me. In fact, I'm now working on a second book that's built around my sketches, which will, I hope, be published, maybe while I'm still alive. And, uh, I can't move any closer. I'll be swallowing it. Move your, I tell you what, Michael, let's move the table a little bit. Okay, thank you. Is that better? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It is better. Okay. Okay. It's not um, it's not better. It's not on. Is that better? Tap it, tap it. Yeah, it's on. It's on. Speak up. Hello, hello, hello. No, no, no. It's not on. It's not on. Is yours on? Yeah. Well, I tell you what. <laughs> Let's get together. Okay. Let's get together. Well, uh, unless you can get it to turn it on and make sure it's working, we'll, we'll, we'll share this. So, uh, okay. you also had early intimations of homosexuality. Uh, your response to being touched by a male stranger at the movies and hoping for more groping when you went back. <laughs> just reporting. Uh, not respond to all the prettiest girls you attracted in college or the kind hearted whores you visited with your buddies. <laughs> I didn't expect these questions. <laughs> well, you told me not to. <laughs> so how did these, but, but, but it's important. How did these early experiences make you feel about yourself and your future? I, I always believed in myself, whether I was homosexual or heterosexual. There was something about me that seemed to attract people. I liked people. They liked me. And whatever I decided to do seemed to work out. Uh, I had no... No regrets on how it happened. Uh, I was very active. You got it? You hear that now? Oh, that's great. Oh, my God. Should we start over? No. No. But um, 
looking back and now at the age of 96 to be such an active person in my mind about my personal life, I never di divorced heterosexuality from homosexuality. I dealt with both equally. Uh, I had a great love affair of 40 years that everybody should have. There's been nobody in my life quite that way since. Uh, and I, I, I actually, if you want to know, I did come out in the army. That was a big deal. I, it was not an easy time for me, but once I was there, the heavens opened up. <laughs> that, was, that was, in fact, just my next question. <laughs> for, the, for, for gays in the army can be very scary and dangerous, but you, uh, it opened a whole welcoming gay world to you. So talk about a little more about that discovery and how it led you to living more or less openly gay. Well, I think the, the reason I lived openly gay is because I found a person in my life who was easy with his sexuality. Uh, we became sort of the poster children for our family. It was quite interesting. Also the poster couple for The Advocate. Anybody here knows what The Advocate is? Uh, I, Jean was, was extremely political, and I have friends over here who remember what happened during the AIDS epidemic out here. We formed a group called, called Ego, which I was one of the original chairs of. There's Zoe and Susan there right now. Uh, it was an easy... Uh, being a homosexual was almost a badge of honor for me. I felt very proper about it. I, and you know, I'm a clothing designer. They expect me to put on chiffon. What's the difference? <laughs> so at one point you write that your choice of a profession in fashion was, quote, good cover for my sexual orientation, unquote. But you detail in your earliest days back in New York after the Army, that orientation helped you get your first work as a courier, a gopher, and, quote, dessert. At some high-class orgies. I was cute. I was so cute. I mean, I got every job because I was cute sexual in the beginning. And I, I, it just, it, it, that was the way it worked, sort of. Uh, but I had to have talent to stay there. All right, I want to get to that. I see your talent came a progression of jobs leading toward real design. So doing what for whom? Mention some names, including the father of one of our Oh, guests. my God. Well, there's Carla Rich, whose father was one of my first bosses back in 19... 53, 1954. I apprenticed with your father. I stayed there with him for eight years. He was my he was my mentor. Uh, he gave me a certain taste level. Uh, it was a different time then. You know, I was president of the CFDA for 16 years, and I've watched. I probably know every designer that's ever ever worked. Uh, and it was not. It was a different time then. You you, you apprentice. You have one room, then a second room, then a third room, and you finally got your own room. Nowadays, everybody's branding themselves before they even graduate college. <laughs> it, it, it's just, it's a, because the pressure is different. It was a mom and pop industry at the time, and I liked my mom and pop, so we had a good business. Uh, finally, you were fired for putting white ruffle on a black chemise, only fit for a clown, the boss said. And, and in fact... You really read my book, didn't you? <laughs> I hope you really wrote it. Yeah. <laughs> and I hope you enjoyed it. Well, you seem to have enjoyed living. But the point is, you in fact turned next to show business. With what background and with what help from whom to get you on the boards? I had such good stuff. Oh my God. I. Everybody here, does everybody here admit to themselves that they have a, they want to be in showbiz, something about their personality? Oh, How many people no. want to be in showbiz? I mean, I, 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 that's the way you play tennis, I know that. The, well, I felt at one point in my life, I kept getting fired. I, w I was doing clothes that maybe weren't the kind of clothes that I was good at, and I asked Jean if I could spend a little time learning how to sing and dance so I'd get on Broadway. Could you believe the chutzpah of that? And within six months, I was on Broadway. I swear I was. I was and in, a, in a, a secondary lead part, but it was basically because I was a great gymnast. I was very, very good gymnast. The perfect body for it. And I don't know, does anybody here remember a show called La Plume de Matin? Absolutely. Oh, my God. Well, I was, I was one of the pullers of the, of the, of the, yeah, the bells. And I got kicked out of the show because I looked too much like the lead, a guy named Robert Clary. I don't know if anybody remembers yeah. him. Robert Clary. He you didn't like me at all. You stole the show. What? You stole the show. Oh, I did. I know. I, he hated me for it. He just hated me for it. We did a, we did a scene in the out, in what they call an outside pissoir, 
uh, which they had in, in Paris at that time. And I had to jump on his shoulder. That was part of the whole thing. He killed me. He crushed me every night. I could hobble off the stage. But he finally got rid of me. And he was a very great actor. Very good. But I was in the show for six months. I learned how to sing. I became, I don't know, maybe I'm running ahead of you, but I became an opera nut. Well, that was the next question, but before that, yeah. you got help financially for some of these lessons from a designer named Arnold Scazzi, although you helped make his name first his, at a Passover dinner. You know, this is so, such a wonderful thing you're doing. I love your <laughs> <laughs> You know, the other day, Michael, my associate, was sitting in the front row, and I, I, I decided I wanted to go to see Arnold's grave. He, he's buried in... In Quag, in East Quag, um, I sang at his at, at his uh, funeral. Um, I sang the Shema Yisrael, and his funeral was in the Presbyterian Church. They never heard the Shema Yisrael in the Presbyterian <laughs> Church. <laughs> but I but I did sing it too. Arnold sponsored my career. He thought I was a terrible designer. He said, "You're a terrible designer. You should be a better singer." I'll sponsor your career. So he sponsored my career. But you have to say how you and your aunt oh, made his name. That's what he could. He as, what, what as, was it before? As it went, as a Jew, his name was Arnold Isaacs, and and the uh, Cadillac people, General Motors, wanted to use his gown in an advertisement, and they wouldn't use a Jewish name, and which is not unusual at the time. And he was trying to figure out his name, and he came to my house for Passover dinner, and uh, my aunt Florence was there. I don't know if my cousin Lloyd is here yet, but there he is, his mama. And I, and she said, well, why don't you spell it backwards? And that's how it all happened. Skazi. Skazi. Oh Isaac became Skazi. Oh I try to do my name backwards, but Yelnats Namre is not a good name. <laughs> <laughs> all right. You were dishing. <laughs> Well, talk about it. You say that, I mean, you, you've skipped it to opera. Uh, yes. And um, with a voice compared to Pavarotti, at least by you. Well, no, my voice, it was the same kind of voice, but my cupidus was, was Pavarotti's cupidus. How do you like that? Yeah. And, and I, I had a beautiful voice, but I wasn't a good singer. I, uh, I was typical tenor. I loved my high notes and forgot my low notes. And, and uh, I couldn't read music quickly enough. But I did sing at the Amato Opera House. I sang in La Boheme. I sang the lead, actually, and I also sang in the Flater Mouse, the second, the second lead. But I'm a real opera nut. Well, talk about that. You say you pay. You sang not only for pay but for therapy. Talk about what opera means to you. Well, it mean I don't know. My brother would would say I, it means. I spend a lot of my day just looking down the throats of singers. <laughs> I'm in love with a, a wonderful singer now named. Uh, Miss Gregorian, Asmik Gregorian. Anybody out there wants a, a natural singer? She's just extraordinary. And actually, this summer, last summer, Guild Hall, they have a what do they call it, Michael? Uh, a boot camp for singers, and they had the greatest tenor in the world there. His name is Michael Spires. He was there for one week. I, 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 go back to your computer and you look up a guy named Michael Spires. It is beyond. He's from the Ozarks. He's American. He's not Pavarotti, but he is the greatest tenor I've ever heard in my life. Uh, but just the sound of a voice gets me, it thrills me. I, just the way we produce without the microphone, the way you produce a sound on the head voice into the chest voice is, is a wondrous experience for me. And just the singing of opera, just, just to hear a woman like Leontine Price go into, alt, go into the high part of her voice, I have orgasms. <laughs> um, yeah. The um, the end of your stage career had much to do with that man in your life, Gene Horowitz, uh, teacher, writer, partner for the next 40 years, to whom you were uh, always true in your fashion, as uh, he also not strictly monogamous, Cole Porter wrote. Right. Well, uh, and too much separation seemed unavoidable with what Kern and Hammerstein called life upon the wicked stage. So you weren't prepared to, to, to be a part for what, what the theater would call for in terms of time and well, on the road and all of that. I, I, I'm, can I pass on this? <laughs> I, 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 
Relationships are a very strange thing. I think I had one of the greatest relationships in the world. I had to balance more than he did. Uh, but when we looked into each other's eyes at the end of the afternoon or the evening, it was always real. There was never, it was never any bullshit. Uh, he didn't let me. Uh, he said he was my 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 shrink. Uh, I was not his shrink. It was just good. You know, it was a good thing. You know, as you get older, you you sort of make a Pollyanna life. You think of your. I've known people who argued all their lives and hated each other. When their husband died, they loved their husband all their lives. <laughs> it's, it's not the case in my life. I, I had, I was lucky to have, he took me out of, uh, when, I, when I first admitted that I was gay in the army and I came back to New York, I was running around like a crazy idiot. And then I hit the wall. I met the guy that kept me there for the rest of my life. And I felt almost, how could you do that to me? I had to have other experiences. I have to have it. I'm not going any further than that. Okay. Uh, we'll hear about more about Jean later because yeah. I've asked Anne to read the chapter uh, in the book. Uh, but there was also a friend's invitation to try Ready to Wear again, a new junior sizing, a new junior market. Talk about that key call and the new adventurous 60s spirit among young designers and young customers. Well, uh, again, I was thrown into a wonderful place. I, uh, like it is right now, firm will test to it. American fashion was was not very important in the world, and and uh, I, the reason I kept getting fired is because I wasn't doing the kind of clothes that were necessary from my from where I was at, uh, and I decided to do younger clothes, and it started. The, I don't even remember Ann Klein. Anybody remember Liz Claiborne? Uh, these are people that were my contemporaries. Annie was a very good friend of mine. We'd sit and drink scotch almost every night at a restaurant called Bill's. And we, we all decided that there's a young market out there. And that changed how fashion was in the 60s. It was the 60s era. Um, what were the hallmarks of your creations at that point? Design, fabrics, color, pants, pleats, belt yeah, robes? I did, I did everything first. I mean, I was very lucky. I, I had great assistants, too. I, you never do everything alone. You, you, build, you build a fortress. And I had marvelous assistants who, who, who almost became better designers than I did. But I was the one who had, who had to make the final decision. For some reason, I hit, the, I hit the, buck, the gong. Everything I did was wonderful. Everybody loved it. Everybody was air kissing me. And then it didn't happen. Then it <coughs> closed. It happens. How did you get to the Mr. Mort line? Was there really a Mr. Mort? And yes. how did the label end up back with you? Well, it, um, that's, I don't know if anybody wants that story. It was, it, was, it was somebody else's label. The man couldn't handle it. Uh, and I was hired as a designer. Low man on the totem pole. And within two years, I was president of the company. What does that mean? I don't know. Uh, I, I, it was, a, it was a, again, a, a different time. The, 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 the company was used, was not being run properly. I saw that. It was closed. I took it over with a, lot, with a giant called Russ Togs. And then I just flew and flew and flew. Everything I did was perfect until it wasn't. And again, can you say what typified your designs in those days? I can't. I can't. I don't know what typified, except they were cute. They were nice. They were young. Well, you do say what? that. My, we, oh, in my, if you get the book, there's a great dress in the book of a knit dress with antarsia details, you know, where the details are knitted in. It blew the whole market open. It, where, I had all these little ladies up in the Bronx sewing, of, of knitting these dresses. That, that was big. I also was the person who did pants underneath dresses with Yves Saint Laurent exactly the same time he did it. It was just one of those things that happens. You also had uh, an ideal Mr. Mort woman in mind. Well, it was Allie McGraw. <laughs> Talk about that. Allie was a friend. I did the clothes for Love Story. You know, the, 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 the uh, uh, and she's still my friend. She lives in New Mexico. She sounds just the same. She's, just, she's 85 years old. She's happy with her life. And I would dress her any day, all the time. She loves the book, too. For years, you could not even join the CFDA, no. the Council of Fashion Designers of America, whose leader was not a designer, but actually a publicist, Al Eleanor Lambert. Talk about her and what the CFDA held against you in those days. They held against me the fact that I, that I was young and I didn't do expensive clothes. Uh, Bill Blast was my, was, was, held, me that, held me out. Then we became great pals. It, it was a different time. It was a time when women wanted to look like their mother. 
Now mothers want to look like their kids. So it, it was it was a completely different time. I mean that, that that was my problem with design. I was designing cocktail dresses for older people, and here I was in my thirties. I should have been designing young clothes for young people. And when that happened, my life changed. So who and what changes in CFDA brought you aboard and then so quickly to the top spot? Was it to some degree, any degree, the fact that you were not seen as really any kind of a threat to the egos and economics of the top stars? I think it's a political thing. Caroline Rome, we, we did a, a big fundraiser and we made we raised $5 million and didn't know what to do with it. Uh, and Caroline Rome, Threw up her, her, she was the president at the time, she threw up her head and said, I can't handle this, I can't handle this, it's just too much. And all the people who were on the board with me felt that I was the one who was the natural follow-up, at least as an interim. And, um, Long interim. Uh, yeah, and that became, that interim became 16 years. Uh, Firm was with me for 10 of those years, Firm. And I went on, and right after we died, the first of her became president, she said, oh darling, Nobody goes in for 16 years, two years, two years. She ended up 13. So it's a very, very seductive business. And after me came Tom Ford, and after that, Tom Brown, who's now our, our president. But Fern and Margaret uh, era was probably the, the most important that CFDA ever had. I fell in love with the council because I had just lost Gene, uh, and he had died of a heart attack in one day, and the council became my lover. Uh, I had time for it. Uh, I was good at it. Uh, again, I'm a people person. Um, that's it. The AIDS well, outbreak. We didn't go through all those questions. We <laughs> <laughs> just gone through them pretty quick. Okay. Uh, the AIDS outbreak took its toll on gays in fashion, but also prompted new camaraderie and activism for the CFDA. You talked about raising the money. Talk about your role in Seventh on Sale, the Brian Park 10, Seventh on Six. Fundraising and philanthropy to support AIDS victims and others in need. That was well. I was I was the president of the organizations, but it was done by firm by the people. Everybody, everybody. We just raised a lot of money for for breast cancer, for AIDS. Uh, that's what a good organization does, and 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 that. Well, before that, it had been sort of self-oriented. Well, it was, I mean, it, it, was, it, was a, it was a fraternity. Was a, it was a fraternity. You turned it into an active, you know, it, purposeful. It was Oscar De Laurentiis' fraternity. It became my sorority. <laughs> <laughs> um, on a personal level, how and, and given what you've said about your behavior, uh, how did you avoid the AIDS plague personally? I'm not going there. <laughs> I, I, you write about it, but okay. No, no, I'm, um, what new trends do you see in American fashion now? That's a hard question to answer. They ever, we're always asked that question. The thing that has changed about fashion is you have choice of wearing any fucking thing you want to wear. You can wear caftans, you can wear caftans, you can wear shirts, blouses, as long as it feels good on you. That's different than it was years ago. There were rules, there were restrictions, there were ways that people had to, women, remember they used to wear gloves, hats, girdles, first girdle I ever designed, I, it was like a fortress, it was outrageous, it was just out, the first bra that I ever designed, you wouldn't believe what it looked like. <coughs> <laughs> Fashion has changed. Women are different. This is a woman's time. It has been. Our industry is one of the first industry. Most important women. Most important people in my industry are women. Have been women, and that's been a big difference. Your entry into the field of corporate uniforms came from an ad agency for which you had done a deodorant TV commercial, but not involved in your own pits, products, and beyond us. Right. So graphically, we hear on TV every day. Okay. What was the connection? Say that again. How did this ad agency hook you up with designing uniforms? They had a client. Uh, yeah, it was Ben and Bowles. It was ben, ben and Bowles. I had done an ad for them for right. Ben and Bowles for Ben deodorant, right. <laughs> which was very successful. And they, that's how they knew me, and they got me involved with Avis uniforms or Avis. The, and from there, it was. <clears throat> I'm still. I'm probably uh, the most important designer in uniforms. I've been doing it for. 40 or 50 years, and Avis was the beginning of it. From there, it went into exploded into all these hotels, all these airlines, 
uh, FedEx. I've been designing FedEx since 1980. Do you believe that? All those years, the same designer. Uh, I did McDonald's for 15 years. Michael and I just did the, the TWA Hotel out in the, in, in, in uh, 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 Kennedy. We just we did we do JetBlue. We also uh, we just did all the clothes for Central Park. Uh, I do all the clothes for a lot of the bids in New York. Um, sandals. Sandals. We just we're doing Central Park Conservancy. Yeah. Say the guys who yeah. do the work. Yeah. Um, and, and sandals, we're doing all 25 hotels down in sandals right now. So we're working. How much time do you spend actually observing the working people you'll be dressing, so to speak, uh, to see how the uniforms have to function as well as how they look? I mean, do you get test pilots or, you know? No, we do. Uh, my client, we, we, we speak to them. We want to know what they feel. <clears throat> it's, a, it's, a, it's like a focus group. It's a magnificent focus group. <clears throat> when you do uniforms, People know who you are. You want to make it good because they can beat you up if they don't like it, let me tell you. Well, for the New Yorker magazine, among others, you've been checking in with workers who wear your uniforms. What, what, is, what do they say to you about them? How does it make them feel to wear them? Man, you made the pants too long. <laughs> <laughs> they, some of them don't even know. I have a wonderful story about all my shirts from FedEx were made out in a little town uh, in Pennsylvania. <clears throat> There's one woman who sewed my label in. It said Stan Herman for Fashion Air for FedEx, and, and she'd been doing it for 20 years. And I went out there to to see the factory, and I looked at I looked at the uh, uh, this woman who was sitting there sewing. And I said, "Hello, I'm Stan Herman." She said, "So." <laughs> <laughs> Your car designing is for uniforms versus the loungewear and such. No, 75, 25. I, we do more uniforms right now, but but I've been on QVC for 31 years. <clears throat> I have a great customer base. I love the camera. Obviously, you know I do. I'm sitting here talking to you this way. Uh, uh, and I'll be something like a return to showbiz. Right, it is showbiz. There's no doubt about it. And the other, uh, Michael was we were talking about the other day. I went down there. Age is a nice thing when people love you at your old, at your old. and when I went down to QVC, I have to tell you, David, the love that came out my, on my way was just unbelievable. I was so good, everybody kissed me and hugged me, and I ended up having COVID. <laughs> <laughs> How did the QVC connection come about? Whose idea was it? It was a, a woman who discovered, who, who, who was filling their coffers, and he felt, she felt that there should be a loungewear designer. And she came to speak to me about it, and that was way, way, way back. That was just all when, just about when Jean died, when I went to QVC, I mean, when I went to the CFTA. Uh, you're bringing back memories that I'm not sure I'm saying the right thing, but. Well, no, I mean, because uh, uh, it was very personal. You, I mean, we remember you having to leave early to drive all the way down to Pennsylvania. I know. But you're Stan Herman. Why don't they let you do it from your house? So, well, they, we they Skype it some of it. Yeah. Some of we, we Skype it. You have to go, really go down. Does anybody here watch QVC? Nobody. Well, one person. But it's, it's, it's a phenomenon. It's been, you know, most designers poo pooed it in the beginning. They, oh, God, I hate doing that. But it's a lot of money, a lot of money for people. What were your biggest sales in a single broadcast? 100,000 rows in one day. Wow. In one day. That was a long time ago, but 100,000 rows in one day. Wrap rope. I can't sell a wrap rope for the life of me now, <laughs> but 100,000 wrap ropes. Okay, some good stories. Uh, so you finally became a household face, if not a name. Uh, talk about the lady wearing one of your trademark wraps whom you stalked for blocks oh, in Manhattan one day. I had a wrap dress and she she looked so great. She, this woman looked so great in it. I, I followed her like a little kid. She walked in front of, in front of Lord and Taylor on Fifth Avenue and she suddenly turns around to me and she says, Yes, it's yours. And if I don't... <laughs> She said, if I don't get the job, I'll blame you. She was going, she was going for a job interview. She never called me. I don't know if she ever got the job. This is not in the book. It was quite a contrast to the lesson in humility you got years earlier at a table with top designers and Hollywood stars, one in particular, 
and um, Rutherford of Gone with the Wind and the Anne Lee Hardy movies. Everybody, anybody remember Anne Rutherford? Of course. Yes. You do. Okay. Well, I, I had a crush on Anne Rutherford. She was the, you know, the the, the girl next door, the sweetheart. And all of the, when Obama Teller opened their first store on the West Coast, they had all the major designers fly out to the West Coast and on a, the the original the 747, the new 747. Every designer was there, and everybody wanted to be at, at Ava Gardner's table or Lana Turner's table. I wanted to be at Anne Rutherford's table, and everybody kept saying, "Who the hell do you want to be?" Well, when we got there, and my table was not in the hot center. I was not the hot designer at that point. We were on the edge, and I looked around, and literally she was at my table, and I was like a kid. And she wasn't there yet. She wasn't Sorry. there yet. She came, she came in with her husband, who was a big shot lawyer uh, at the time. She looked, she walked around the table, she looked at the table, she looked at the table, she looked at me, she looked at the thing, and she said, who the fuck are you? <laughs> <laughs> Which put me in my place. <laughs> uh, a section of your memoirs headlines stuff, things important to, in your life outside fashion. There's a giant tennis racket in New, your New York apartment. Right. Tell us what tennis has meant to you, besides having to... Well, David, you know better than anybody what's meant to me. It, it's, uh, I played with David for years and years and years and years. It, as an older person, it means that you're still young, if you can do it. Uh, as an older person, it makes you feel great when you get off the, when you can go right and left. And, and, of course, you know I love a chop shot. Uh, and uh, everybody should have something like tennis in their life. I don't know what's going to happen with my tennis now. I, 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 I had a fall. Every older person has a fall. I had a fall. I never thought I'd have a fall. And I'm in the recuperative state. You never, you would never know how strong I was by tonight. <laughs> I mean, I, I hope I play tennis again. I do. I do. Cars are also among you, yes. your favorite things, as I know from some good advice you gave me on buying mine. Uh, and you explain why you generally have both a Range Rover and a Jeep. Oh, Not because one has better pickup than the other, but because each has distinctly different pickup potential. Absolutely. The Jeep gets one guy, the other the Rover gets another. I <laughs> think, no. Yes. Yes. Go. Next question. Right. Next one. Next one. I think that's enough for me. I think the time has come for you to read oh. some of what you feel are the most meaningful sections. That, no, this, I, I didn't know he was going to do this. This is terrific. I feel. You know, what did you think? I don't know. I think, <laughs> you know, I just before I start reading, let, let me say, um, right after Jean died, I wanted to write a book. Uh, I, I, did, I started to write a book called, called uh, Notes and Sketches, just stories. Lots of stories, maybe 100, maybe 200, 300. It, it didn't go anywhere. It, uh, I had an agent, and it would, uh, I was president of CFDA at the time, and everywhere it went, they kept saying, we want dirt, we want dirt, we, we don't want uh, these stories, we want dirt. And I didn't have it in me to, to do that. When the when COVID happened and, and I was out here for all that time, I sat in my big chair and I had two friends who, were, who I respect. I, I said, you think I can do it? They said, yes. And then I had fallen in love with a, a writer named Jan Morris. Did anybody know Jan Morris? Yes. Uh, who, who loves the city of, uh, of Trieste. And she wrote a book, her book in her 94th year. <clears throat> and I thought, well, if she can do it, I'm going to try it. Mm -hmm. And so on that little leather chair that I have in my house, I, I started notes and sketches, and when I read the first chapter to James and John, so they said, we think it's right now. So, and then I, I built the book, and I, my friend Jeffrey Banks, who's here, a very, very good friend of mine, who has had six books published. Uh, also a well-known designer. Right. And he, he and book review for the East Hampton Star. Absolutely. <laughs> he also, uh, said to me there should be more pictures in the book. It should be, a, I didn't want a coffee table book. I, I, I wanted more like a, I don't know, a smaller, a smaller book. So it's not a coffee table, it's more cocktail table. <laughs> and, and it's a beautiful book. It's the, uh, they did a beautiful job with it. The publishers in the back, Susie, I would say, I'm so happy to be with them because we could work together and make it into a pretty book. Every decision was made. Made it. Every time I pick it up, I get a little chill. So I will read something. I don't know. We have time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And this one, the first story is called the parlor car. I remember. Remember the parlor cars that came out here. 
You did okay. I felt I'd read a story about the parlor car. <clears throat> when people find out how long I've been in the Hamptons, and at this moment it's over 65 years, the first thing they ask is, What was it like then? You must have seen lots of changes. I did, and although I still feel the east end of Long Island is special, and I will be there until I die, it's not the same. Those potato fields and untouched dunes, the empty back roads and the shuttered estates are long gone. But what I miss most are the Pullman parlor cars that made up the Cannonball Express. The 4.30 p.m. out of Penn Station, aging, plush, swivel chairs lining either side of the car, far enough from each other to ensure privacy. If my memory is correct, I think there were Persian runners the length of the car, and there was a bar car to start the weekend the minute you got onto the train. <laughs> There were old Pullman cars hand-me-down from the railroad's heyday. There were even a few compartmental cars that gave you the feeling that you were on a tacky Orient Express. <laughs> For me, those trips every weekend during the summer months, a hundred miles of track from city to beach, represent the Hamptons I knew in the 50s. Just the way the countryside changed as the train moved eastward, the sudden sight of duck farms in the Mariches, a quick glimpse of water when quag appeared, all those families waiting for the breadwinners who arrived for the weekend. For me, it was Jean waiting at the Southampton stop, always in the same spot, competing with Charlotte Ford, screaming for Edsel. Mayor Lindsay waving down his distracted Mary, and Kathy de Montezemolo, the Vogue editor and fashion icon, picking up her bike for the trek to the compound. My first trips with Jean were by car, and almost five hours from the city, four on a good day. That's why the Hamptons were exclusive, and the fact that it was a resort without hotels. And day tripping was day adventurous, and the season was short. The end of June to September, few people stayed later, although, as I remember, there was a small group who remained until the holidays celebrating Oktoberfest before leaving for Florida. <clears throat> there was also a lot of locals who felt privileged to mingle with society, who serviced their homes and country clubs. It was very, very Republican and very white. The biggest tension was between the Catholics and the Protestants. The Murray family compound with its imposing high wall with the Catholic foothold in Southampton. There wasn't a Jew in sight. And they were there. The cemetery in Sag Harbor is proof of that. In Southampton, the few that were known were the merchants, the ghouls, the presses, the Chef Miller, and the Silvers. Those are the ones I knew. The woman, Rebel Biggs, who sold me the property I live on, had married into one of the upstanding local families. <clears throat> Her lover, Bill Dunwell, was the town historian and, the, and ran the Southampton Beach Club. She loved rubbing up against the privileged class and took on many of their attributes. She was also considered by many to have witch-like powers <clears throat> and played that part well at this historical society summers. She was the first person who read my horoscope, beginning a lifetime of interest in astrology. She became Jean and my mother's, and, and Jean and my surrogate mother. I'm still living on that property I bought from her, and as I look across the lake, the vista is the same. Only the trees are taller, and a few more houses are clinging to the shoreline. The movement of seagulls, mallards, and Canadian geese still ruffle the waters, cleansing their feathers. In fact, not even enough has changed to drive me away from this paradise. Just a walk on the beach in the winter sun can revitalize these bones. I watched the village of Southampton close over these years. <clears throat> Downtown, Joe's Lane, once considered one of America's great shopping resort streets, can no longer compete for that title. The silhouettes are the same, but the shuffle of the store owners has changed. Rents have skyrocketed, and a few can stay in all year round businesses. There are a few landmark stores left, like Herbert and Wrist, my liquor store, rubbing up against a Carvel. Antique stores that no longer have the panache of Colwell Alexander's Seminole store, and many, too many, women's boutique clothing stores filling the spaces that are used, used to sell groceries. Although we've lost Bob Keane's historical bookstore and Southampton's first art gallery, we still have the country's oldest department store, Hildreth's, and I have the second oldest charge account there. <laughs> <laughs> Herrick's hardware still has its squawking parrot greeting you when you enter the back way, and the great Katina family still dispenses the best meat in town and remains a democratic oasis in this, in this Republican stronghold. Of course, there should be pumpernickel still sizzling steaks, one of which almost killed me before my cousin Lloyd applied the Heimlich maneuver. 
John Duck's long gone was Friday night dining for almost everyone. The great chef, Craig Claiborne, used to sleep off his hangover in the parking lot in the old in the only other Rover sedan on the East Coast. And I, I and so often I had to wake him up and tell him he was in my car. <laughs> Just the other day, Silver's, the last soda fountain turned restaurant, closed forever. The Goulds, the Millers, and the Press family are no longer are long gone. We have our Ralph Lauren, and we used to have Saks Fifth Avenue, but Southampton has never become the boutique for the wannabes. East Hampton easily takes that prize. Now I'm in my sixth decade in a house that I shared with Jean for almost 40 of those years. The choice to move here was a wise one. It could have been Connecticut, the Catskills, or the Hudson Valley, but it was this lake that lured us. The Hamptons today seem so posh and untouchable to so many people, but to the two of us, it was always home. Even if our new friends were sometimes famous names and we squeezed the same vegetable as Schmitz that the power players did, we treated it the same way anyone treats their hometown. I get my mail, shop for food, fill my car with gas, call the plumber to fix the toilet, see my brother's family for Friday night dinner, have my car washed every two weeks, get my 20 pound bag of bird feed with a hand gesture at Lynch's, now Fowler's, and, complain about, and complain about the traffic and those new people sucking up the air. <laughs> oh yes, it has changed in almost 70 years, <clears throat> but I can live with those changes. Just walking on the beach, either on the bay or the ocean, brings everything into perspective. By the way, the trains that come out from the city these days are no faster than those parlor car days, but you can be sure there's not a swivel car in sight. A swivel chair in sight, sorry. That's I like that, I like that, very nice. It's fun to read your own writing. <laughs> and there's more. Yeah, there's more. I, Yes, we've got time, okay. The hook will come when it's... Well, I because I, I want to make sure I only read the, the last story, because that's important. But David asked me to, to read about Jean. I can't not make... I can't tell you how important he was in my life. I, I just went with Michael upstairs to look for his books. He wrote, he was a novelist, and they're gone. They're not here anymore. But I... But I um, there was a, a sign of a, of, of, of a sister who had, who I had paid I met, met 30 years ago, no, 20 years ago. She's got a corner of, with all the books there, and I just was clutching, clutching it that, that Esther was here with me today. <clears throat> His books are not here anymore, but she is. So this is about Jean. It's a little sexy. I hope you don't want. Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> it's about time I started talking about <clears throat> the most important person in my life. We met on July 25th, 1953, at 5.30 in the afternoon. I was at Fred Frederick's apartment waiting in the wings for an orgy to start. One of the participants coming in from Los Angeles was late, so we all decided to go to a bar called the William Tell on 54th Street. Just as we, just as we entered, I spotted a sunburned wisp of a man wearing a heavy tweed jacket and my life change forever. It was a time when a gay bar one never touched one another. You never knew when the cops would be watching or the bay bartender would snitch on you. But I waved him to follow me to the back of the bar and we followed and the minute we touched there was no going back. I told him I could, couldn't see him until the next day but I would be home by two in the morning. He said he would wait. I gave him my telephone. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> I gave him my telephone number and street address, which was the rooming house right off of Tony Fifth Avenue near Central Park. I don't remember the details of the orgy, but I do remember the telephone ringing and sneaking him up past the landlady. I didn't go to work for the next two days. We never left the room. Just eight months after my discharge from the Army, while I was waking, making up for lost time sex, I suddenly hit the wall of contentment. I found a person who made sex with my own sex seem as natural as what I was taught heterosexual sex would be. He was the person I wanted to start building my life with. A year into our relationship, we had just finished having great sex on a lazy afternoon. I remember the sun was shining through an open door. Both of us had lit up our cigarettes. I was a two-pack-a-day smoker in spastic, Bette Davis style. 
He, more Paul Henri, with long drags that produce an endless stream from every orifice. He turned to me and said, I think we should split. I don't think you're ready for the same kind of commitment. I love you, I'll wait for you, and when you feel you can live with me without guilt or frustration, we will build a life. I couldn't believe this was happening as far as I was concerned. I was in love. And in the year that we were together, I hadn't, I should say, almost hadn't fucked around. I know I can be a knee-jerk flirt, but he was my guy, and I knew I would never feel this way with anyone else. I was devastated and confused. As it turned out, he was right. He took a big chance when he made that decision. He knew it. I was suddenly back on the market, nursing beer at the village bar scene, leaning up against the meat rack on the west edge of, of western edge of Washington Square Park, following big baskets into the bushes, rediscovering the world of eye contact in all the old familiar places. I lived sorry. I quickly reintroduced myself to the gay underground and find myself in the arms of some pretty heavy hitters. Ellsworth Kelly, who was still in his Rembrandt period. Gore Vidal, who bedded and beheaded many. His sweetheart lover, Howard, who took singing lessons with me. The underestimated gay icon, Bernard Perlin, who had, made the most, had the most beautiful penis and the one designer I had a fantasy crush on, Chuck Howard. We were mirror eras of, images of each other, which did not make for great sex. Just about a year later, Gene came down into the city in the seafoam de Soto. It was a snowy Christmas Eve, and my friend Selma had shaved me into seeing him. When the buzz, buzzer rang and he walked up those four flights, by the time he reached the top landing, I knew my life had changed. I lifted him into my short arms, my short and strong arms, and soap operas as it may sound, that was the beginning of an extraordinary 40-year-long relationship. Our sex was always good. My inability to totally let go up and stop it from being great. He was always ready and I was always feeling guilty about the quickies I had had. For much of our life, after Gene stopped teaching, he would spend summers in the Hamptons, which would leave me to too much time to twist and turn and avoid temptation. It was always his welcome arms when I came home. We were a couple that loved to dance together, very often changing roles during the dance. I wanted to lead. He would let that happen until I suddenly realized I was being led. He was the housekeeper, but never the Griselda. I was the provider who came home to the order he loved. He was a very, very sexy man. His smell was delicious, and all of his large appendages provocative to me. And from his nose to his toes and everything in between, he was my type. To this day, I'm stuck dead in my tracks by anyone who looks like him. I'm using terms that heterosexuals use in their relationship because we were a couple in that sense, but we didn't have the road signs to follow. There was no written regulations to keep us together in the homosexual world. We had no prenups, no divorces, no children. It was just the two of us, surrounded by his understanding family and my uncomfortable family. We built our life together gracefully, much that had to do with our friends. We were both working in professions we loved, and in truth, we were not hemmed in by restrictive rules and regulations. Gene and I became post couple in The Advocate, the gay magazine at the time, and they were looking for normalcy in relationships. People constantly described our affair as inspirational. We thought it was just normal. After he died, quick sex became easier again. Every, every, even then, I carried guilt with me for at least five years. It became my way of avoiding a serious relationship. Better a trucker looking for action than someone holding hands with, with you at the opera. Better a butcher for Bohax than shopping for fruit with a lover or a fireman, for fruit with a lover or a fireman named Tom that part, than party talk behind the Hampton Hedges. Sex had always seemed available and I could conquer without, and I could conquer without obligation. Over the years, there were few that became steadies. If I had to learn how to edit text, I would probably be doing it, still doing it. There were even a few who took it seriously, some who even recognized me while watching QVC with their wives. I'd become an artful cruiser, Range Rovers tracked in one type, Jeeps another. Even to this day, I have both, and my cup runneth over. Gene will continue to appear many more times in this memoir. He has touched almost every aspect of my life. Even 30 years after his death, which is very much like the first night I met him, when everything happened very quickly, he had a major heart attack at 6 in the morning, a massive one that plugged in, when plugged into monitoring machines at Beth Israel Hospital later that day. The last time I saw him alive, he pleaded with me to go home and walk our dog Moe. 
He said he was fine. The moment I got into the apartment, the phone rang and a woman's voice said, I better get back to the hospital quickly. Mr. Harless was not doing well. Mo was writhing on the floor, his body spasming from an epileptic attack. I dropped to my knees, cradling him in my arms, trying to stop from choking on his tongue. I was forced to leave him, still fighting his way back, pleading with him to understand. It's a short cab ride from my apartment to Beth Israel, but not short enough. When I got there, a young, well-muscled black woman swept me into her arms and took me into a battered room. Mr. Harwis did not make it. I don't know how many people before me beat those walls in agony, but I beat them until I was exhausted. Reality took over and I started to reach out to friends and family. My man was gone. We were a ma married couple surrounded by a surprisingly supportive world. The centerpiece couple and his family moving easily through the pothole fields of prejudice that gays often encountered. I always wondered if he let go when that second heart attack battered him, releasing me to a new life that swept me back into the competitive world of fashion. I'll never know. Do we have time for two? Do we have time for one more? One more? Yes. yes. Okay. If you'll give me the hand. I'll do the last. I'll do the last. The last story. Um, the last story was important to me. I wrote it, not the last, but it. It's um, it, it, the titled story of the of the of the of the book. It's, um, it's called and Crush Your Legs. <clears throat> Coming to the end of this memoir, I'm finding it hard to let go. Not because I fear endings, but because more writing has given me a safe haven this past year, and I've enjoyed it. So this past year was one of the most complicated I've ever lived through. I had my first operation at the age of 91. It was one of the most likely candidates for infection during the pandemic. Then there was the shock of the exodus from New York, the city I so, I so love, and the transitioning to a full-time living in the house that I always thought would be my final resting place. Somehow, the slower pace that nature demands has given me the time to write, to feed my ducks, stretch my living quarters to accommodate close friends and their dogs, rediscover the beaches, the farm stand, the best butcher in town, and where do I get my shirts ironed? It was a week that QVC booked me twice on their late night primetime shows. It was the same week I was left to my own device with no one at the house to help me make my own stage set. Yes, I was no longer driving down to the QBC headquarters to go on air, everything now done through Skype. Although my good friend Grant had artfully rehearsed this aging motor moron and felt, that I could com and felt confident that I could do it myself, I, I didn't feel confident at all. He had plugged the plug, set the lights, opened the computer, and all I had to do was press the green button and look into the camera. While waiting for my cue for the show's producer that would lead me back to the world, my mind began to wander. Here I was in my tenth decade, dressed from the waist up in a four-ply navy cashmere sweater, looking into a camera that would connect me to a hundred million households in a room so private that I didn't have to wear pants at all if I didn't want to, <laughs> surrounded by all of the stuff I've collected over the years, sitting next to a vase filled with searching sunflowers and holding in my hand the lucky owl figure that I had bought in Greece in front of me was the picture I had painted 50 years ago of our hot waterless shack and the 150 bird figurines I had collected. Me sitting comfortably on the many window ledges of I had collected, sitting comfortably on the many window ledges of the house. I rubbed my eyes, smudging the Kevin O'Quan concealer cream that the lady at White's apothecary had forced on me as a gift. Little sample packets that would mask my aging dark spots. I began cruising through the years piling up moments of pleasure and pain that these walls were familiar with. Crossing my right leg over the less, I waited. Every minute seemed eternal. The green light was not yet green. The one that seemed to be hanging, the one thought that seemed to be hanging in the air was just how much I loved my privacy and how I was always able to find that in the very public world of fashion. Nothing could have revealed that lifestyle better than this very moment. Alone with my legs crossed, waiting to enter center stage, and then crossing my legs in front of the largest audience of my life. My friend James, <clears throat> the gentleman who does my horoscope, has always told me about my moon in Scorpio being in my fifth house 
and how it has turned this very private Virgo into a proscenium arch queen once the camera starts to roll. This was to be a 12-minute hit set aside for my zip front row, my most popular item in my arsenal at home loungewear. When the lights went on, I uncrossed my legs, pitched my voice higher, and greeted the two hosts, Leah and Sean, with my usual abundance of energy. We sold over 4,000 pieces in 12 minutes, way beyond the expected goal, and I was a hero once more. At the very end of the cell, the producer said, we need more Stan Herman on the evening shows. <laughs> oh, yes, you do. <laughs> it was midnight, and this Cinderella was ready to slip out of his cashmere and wrap himself in the fluff of blankets in his bedroom. There was always a fire in the fireplace. How decadent and earthy to fall asleep to a flickering flame. On my way upstairs, <clears throat> I suddenly realized that my left foot had fallen asleep from all the crossings and uncrossings. I wondered if any of those front row A-listers at the fashion shows had collapsed in pain just as I did. Has writing this memoir given me the secret to uncrossing my legs? Have the private parts of my life respected the public parts and vice versa? I wonder if Jan Morris was able to uncross her legs down there in Wales. I wonder how much longer I'll be enjoying the simple action of placing one leg over the other and comfortably dangling my toes in midair. How long before both feet fall asleep? and privilege to know you, and I trust the audience tonight now shares some of that feeling. Uh, thanks to them all for coming. Thanks to you again from us all. The books await. Thank you. Uh,